Hello everyone, this is your friend Carl here at the home office and we dive into the daily Bible reading. It's January 22nd and today's reading is Genesis chapters 44 and 45 and we're in the middle of Joseph's story in Egypt during the Great Famine. And you know, if you've been following, Pharaoh has allowed Joseph to be number two. He's in charge over all of Egypt. His brothers have come from Canaan to get food because they're starving. And he's working the situation here to reveal who he is to his brothers. They don't recognize him. So chapter 44, the story of Joseph's silver cup. Here we go. When his brothers were ready to leave, Joseph gave these instructions to his palace manager. Fill each of their sacks with as much grain as they can carry and put each man's money back into a sack. There you go, putting the money back in the sack again. Then put my personal silver cup at the top of the youngest brother's sack, along with the money for his grain. So the manager did as Joseph instructed him. We don't know if the manager knew what Joseph was up to, and it really wouldn't be his business to know. Joseph's the boss. But I bet he's wondering what's up. Verse 3, the brothers were up at dawn and were sent on their journey with their loaded donkeys. But when they had gone only a short distance and were barely out of the city, Joseph said to his palace manager, chase after them and stop them. When you catch up with them, ask them, why have you repaid my kindness with such evil? <laughs> why have you stolen my master's silver cup? which he uses to predict the future. Hmm. Interesting. What a wicked thing you have done. When the palace manager caught up with the men, he spoke to them as he had been instructed. What are you talking about? The brothers responded. We are your servants and we would never do such a thing. Didn't we return the money we found in our sacks? We brought it back all the way from the land of Canaan. Why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If you find his cup with any of us, let that man die. Uh-oh. <laughs> and all the rest of us, my Lord, will be your slaves. So they're so sure of themselves that nothing has happened. And um, I take a note from that saying, never be hasty with your words. Get the information. I read these stories and just people blurt out stuff. We're just supposed to guard our tongues and be slow to anger, slow to... Be thoughtful, seek wisdom, knowledge, discernment, understanding before you speak or before you make vows or before you extend yourself farther than you should. So crazy. Okay, there you go. What are you talking about? So they're saying, and they, they're willing to be slaves and let the brother be killed that has it or whoever's got it. That's fair, the man replied, but only the one who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go free. So the manager kind of knows what Joseph is up to. They all quickly took their sacks from the backs of their donkeys and opened them. The palace manager searched the brothers' sacks from the oldest to the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. When the brothers saw this, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. Well, they weren't about to, you know, let Joseph stay. Joseph was still in his palace when Judah and his brothers arrived, and they fell to the ground before him. What have you done? Joseph demanded. Don't you know that a man like me can predict the future? Judah answered, Oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins. My Lord, we have all returned to be your slaves, all of us, not just our brother who had your cup in his sack. No, Joseph said, I would never do such a thing. Only the man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go back to your father in peace. Then Judah stepped forward and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant say just one word to you. Please do not be angry with me, even though you are as powerful as Pharaoh himself. My Lord, previously you asked us, your servants, do you have a father or a brother? And we responded, Yes, my Lord, we have a father who is an old man, and his youngest son is a child of his old age. His full brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children. And his father loves him very much. And you said to us, bring him here so I can see him with my own eyes. But we said to you, my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father for his father would die. 
but you told us unless your youngest brother comes with you, you will never see my face again. So we returned to your servant, our father, and told him what you had said. Later, when he said, go back again and buy us more food, we replied, we can't go unless you let our youngest brother go with us. We'll never get to see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then my father said to us, as you know, my wife had two sons, and one of them went away and never returned. Doubtless he was torn to pieces by some wild animal. See, Joseph or Jacob still thinks, you know, Joseph was killed as the brothers hinted by some wild animal because of the bloody coat. Remember that? I've never seen him since. Now, if you take his brother away from me and any harm comes to him, you will send this grieving white-haired man to his grave. And now, my Lord, so now he's telling this to Joseph, which Joseph knows all this. And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving, white-haired man to his grave. My Lord, I guaranteed my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the anguish this would cause my father. Hmm. 45. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you! So he was alone with his brothers, and when he told them who he was, then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him. Wow, imagine that. He's in the palace. He sent out all the Egyptians. He's only in there with his brothers, wailing. Amazing. And word of it quickly carried, carried to Pharaoh's palace. They're like, what is going on here? They, they don't know the story. So it's amazing. It's, it's such a trauma that they're sending word to Pharaoh that something's up with Joseph. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, <laughs> your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made, an adv made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, the governor of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen, where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, your household and all your animals will starve. So Joseph still knows this famine's just getting started. That The rest of the people have no idea. Joseph is prepared. God made him ready. Amazing. Verse 12, then Joseph added, look, you can see for yourselves and so can my brother Gen Gen Benjamin that I really am Joseph. So somehow he revealed himself. He might have had the Egyptians always adored themselves, maybe with, with uh, you know, jewelry and wigs and whatever, makeup. So now he's making revealing himself. Go tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after that, they began talking freely with him. Wow, what an amazing story of resolve and forgiveness and big vision you know they're 
God did something totally crazy seeing the life of a man and making it work. Stunning. The news soon reached Pharaoh's palace. Joseph's brothers have arrived. Pharaoh and his officials were all delighted to hear this. So they're thinking, wow, awesome. Joseph has this huge family. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, this is what you must do. Load your pack animals and hurry back to the land of Canaan. Then get your father and all of your families and return here to me. I will give you the very best land in Egypt and you will eat from the best that the land produces. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, take wagons from the land of Egypt to carry your little children and your wives and bring your father here. Don't worry about your personal belongings for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Joseph has such favor with Pharaoh. Verse 21, so the sons of Jacob did as they were told. Joseph provided them with wagons as Pharaoh had commanded and he gave them supplies for the journey and he gave each of them new clothes. But to Benjamin, he gave five changes of clothes and 300 pieces of silver. So Joseph, amazing, amazing. So Joseph made his young brother a wealthy man immediately. He also sent his father 10 male donkeys loaded with the finest products of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other supplies he would need on his journey. So Joseph sent his brothers off and as they left, he called after them, don't quarrel about all this along the way. Interesting. <laughs> Joseph knows the nature of his brothers. It's so funny. Don't quarrel about all this along the way. Like, just enjoy it. Don't worry about who's got what, is what he's saying. And they left Egypt and returned to their father, Jacob, in the land of Canaan. Joseph is still alive, they told him, and he is governor of all the land of Egypt. Jacob was stunned at the news, and he couldn't believe it. But when they repeated to Jacob everything Joseph had told them, and when he saw the wagons Joseph had sent to carry him, their father's spirits revived. Amazing. Then, then Jacob exclaimed, It must be true. My son Joseph is alive. I must go and see him before I die. And that's the readings for the 22nd. Through We read through chapter 45. Okay, today's psalm, bam, Psalm 18, starting at, now remember I backtracked, I did, <laughs> for some reason I missed the calendar, and I read Psalm 19, for some, somebody needed to hear it, I loved it too, we'll read it again, but today we finish out Psalm uh, 18, starting at 37, you have given me your shield of victory, your right hand supports me, your help has made me great. You have made a wide path for my feet to keep them from slipping. I chased my enemies and caught them. I did not stop until they were conquered. I struck them down so they could not get up. They fell beneath my feet. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued my enemies under my feet. You placed my foot on their necks and I have destroyed all who hated me. They called for help, but no one came to their rescue. They even cried to the Lord, but he refused to answer. I ground them as fine as dust in the wind. I swept them into the gutter like dirt. You gave me victory over my accusers. You appointed me ruler over nations. People I don't even know now serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they submit. Foreign nations cringe before me. They all lose their courage and come trembling from their strongholds. Verse 46. The Lord lives. Praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. He is the God who pays back those who harm me. He subdues the nations under me and rescues me from my enemies. You hold me safe beyond the reach of my enemies and you save me from violent opponents. For this, O Lord, I will praise you among the nations. I will sing praises to your name. You give great victories to your king. You show unfailing love to your anointed, to David and all his descendants forever. Which is now in the lineage of David and the bloodline into Jesus is all of us. All of us in the Lord now receive unfailing love and uh, favor from the Lord. So remember as you're reading Psalms in Old Testament, just a reminder we don't pray this way against enemies anymore. 
Jesus now says to pray for your enemies, bless those that curse us. So in the new covenant, this gets kind of turned around. But in that time and that season of the earth and of history, yeah, a kings, kings and tribes and clans battled and fought and God's people battled and fought with, you know, the heathen. It's just the way they function then. Um, of course, wars and rumors of wars and everything still happens in modern times. But the heart of the believer should never be gloating in uh, destruction of an enemy. Yeah, we have wars. There are situations where battles are just and um, we believe that it's right for a nation and for people to defend themselves. But it shouldn't be something that where Christians should be the aggressors. We're called to be the peacemakers. And even through the rest of Scripture, the Lord is not pleased when believers gloat in a victory because it's really the Lord's. Very important to remember that. So I'm going to move on. The reading for Proverbs today is Proverbs 4, verses 11 through 13. Proverbs 4, I'm going to back up to 10 just a bit. Here's verse 10. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. Verse 11, I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. Again, this is more of a father speaking, but the spirit of wisdom is speaking through that. Verse 12, when you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Verse 13, take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Man, the words of God, words of wisdom are the key to life. A reminder, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, the awe of God, the respect of God, not our own thoughts, not our own earthly wisdom. The, the wisdom of God is way beyond that. Um, and, you know, sure, earthly wisdom and philosophies may be connect to that in a bit and in pieces, but the word of God overshadows that, really. Anyway, it gives us more. So today's reading for the New Testament is Matthew 13 through 30, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 36. So we'll finish this chapter. So we've just read Jesus has been doing many parables, speaking many parables, many, many miracles. And we've read just uh, the story about John the Baptist being killed. His head was chopped off. Sad. Okay. So as soon as Jesus heard this, news. He left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. Hmm. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowds and he, as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy some food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. <laughs> Here we go. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people, sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people, and they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Hmm. I always wondered if 12 baskets was symbolic. Hmm. I must ask the Lord. Verse 21, about 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. There you go. That's how they counted. So 5,000 men, which probably means at least many of them were married and had families. So it could have been, who knows, 7,000 people. It doesn't matter. The miracle is... Because Jesus spoke and blessed it, and he knew he was going to be the God of provision that he is. I would imagine as they're carrying around this bread, as they break it, it just doesn't go away. That's how I envision this. The fish and the bread, it just keeps, they try to break it or cut it up, and there's just more. Imagine they're carrying these baskets, and I bet every time they look down, it's just full. So it's amazing. Jesus walks on water. Verse 22, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. How about that? 
Even God, Jesus, Emmanuel, is going to a quiet place to pray by himself to be with the Father. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, man, across the lake in the dark, nasty storm, the waves are bad. Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When, they, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Peter, what is he thinking? Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. <laughs> Jesus said, why did you doubt me? <laughs> now we know Jesus is love. He's the redeemer. Isn't it funny? Because what, what Jesus would say, oh, my friend, let me help you. No, he says, you have so little faith. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a reprimand, people. Jesus is always challenging us to step in higher, to know him more, and to trust and to have faith. It's not always going to be, oh, that's okay. I've got you. No, have some faith. Where is? What are you doing? You have so little faith. Why did you doubt Verse 32, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Note, the disciples did worship Jesus. Didn't recognize him just as a special man or as a prophet or as a rabbi. No, they recognized he was, quote, the capital Son of God, the Messiah, Yeshua, the sent one. Because people... Sometimes question, well, people didn't worship Jesus. He didn't claim to be God. He did claim to be God, and the disciples worshiped him as God. And it's not blasphemy because they recognize that he is God, and this is becoming the revelation of the nature of God. Moving on. Verse 34, after they crossed the lake, <laughs> they landed at Gennesaret, or Gesenaret. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area, and soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. Another way of healing. Jesus speaks it. Sometimes Jesus touches. Sometimes Jesus puts spits and puts muds on people. Here's people just, it, it's just going out from him. People just want to touch him. They touch him and they get healed. Wow. There you go, folks. That's Matthew 14. That's good stuff. So that's the daily Bible reading. Be encouraged. Pray as you read. I always encourage people, pray as you read. Ask the Lord to speak to you as you read. Invite Holy Spirit to reveal wisdom and understanding. Take notes. I still like a paper Bible. Yeah, I've got a bunch of digital stuff on the computer and all that, but man, yeah, scribble right in the, right in the, you know, sides, put question marks, put you know, you can get colored pens. People do all kinds of ways to study. It's a good way to stir, you know, your thinking and your spirit about the Word of God. So anyway, have a blessed day. We'll see you tomorrow again with the reading of the Bible in a year. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.